Hello again, everybody. This is Craig Evans of Autism Hangout, and thank you for tuning into this episode of the Ask Dr. Tony Show, where Dr. Tony Atwood answers your questions about autism. Hello, Dr. Tony. We're now in a post-COVID world. Are you indeed out traveling across continents talking about autism? <laughs> Thanks for that lovely welcome there, Craig. Uh, I've just come back from uh, Europe, a series of presentations there. But as soon as I got back, I got COVID. Oh, my. Um, and COVID is actually far more debilitating than I thought it would be. So I'm slowly recovering. However, I feel good for today. Okay, excellent. Well, we have, as always, lots and lots of questions, and people are interested in you, so let's just get right to it. Let's go. Lots of questions about meltdowns this time, Dr. T, so I've grouped two now that represent the most inquiries. Hello, we have an almost seven-year-old son in his third year of schooling. Most school mornings, he's cried when I leave, and recently it's gotten worse, with him screaming and throwing furniture. He becomes quite violent when he has a meltdown, and they seem to be lasting longer. The longest to date is one hour and 45 minutes. He also has ADHD, and I suspect undiagnosed oppositional defiant and pathological demand avoidance conditions. What advice do you have to help when leaving him at school in the mornings? And also, do you have any tips on how to help when younger siblings have developed a fear of our son because of his violent outbursts? Okay, what you're describing here very eloquently is separation anxiety. Very common for young autistic children. The question is why? Now, in autism, you are at risk of high levels of anxiety. This child has extraordinary high levels of anxiety. But it is mum who reads the child, soothes him, and explains a chaotic world to him and him to the world itself. The school environment is very daunting. It is overwhelming. But the one person who soothes and relaxes me and calms me and makes life uh, bearable in a way is mum. And she's gone. And how on earth do I cope? And the distress is, I don't know how to cope. Uh, it's just so powerful. I don't know what to do. Uh, the person says PDA is possibly there. But PDA, pathological demand avoidance, refusing to make um, comply with simple requests, is anxiety based. So I'm going to go through several components here. Now, uh, the first one is to deal with the anxiety. Now, he's seven years old <laughs> and I'm going to have a quick plug for two books uh, written by my, sh my, <laughs> my shelf, <laughs> myself and Michelle Garnett. Uh, having fun with feelings on the autism spectrum, an activity book for kids, four to eight years old, is in the age range. So that's the book that the child goes through. And this is the actual book that the parents will use to help him learn how to identify and manage his anxiety. Now, those are published by uh, Jessica Kingsley Publishers. I uh, wrote this program called Exploring Feelings, CBT to Manage Anxiety. A long time ago, actually, published by Future Horizons in the USA. This is for kids eight plus, eight to about 13. Clinical psychologists may be able to help, but in the long term, it's helping him understand his anxiety and learn alternative strategies than having to rely on mum. Now, the question then is, uh, how do you cope in the school morning? So first of all, Try and ensure that your son is the first to arrive in the class. I don't know whether everyone lines up and goes into class uh, all together or they just arrive and mingle into the class. But it may be if you can go into the class where it's just mum and teacher, no other kids. It's calm and relaxing. And then he gets used to other children coming in. It's a good transition to be there alone and have that build up. The second is information to alleviate anxiety and a, a schedule for the day. It may be in picture form or word form. So he knows exactly what's going on, what's happening now, later, next, etc. And so in that information, he can prepare himself for what's going on. The third component is could mum guide his teacher in how to calm him down and distract him and work together. So when he's distressed, for the teacher to pick up what uh, mum is doing and then for 
the teacher to try and duplicate what mum is doing to be more successful. OK, so they watch each other and guide each other in the do's and don'ts of watching and coping with his noggin. Now, with the siblings, uh, it depends on their age, but they need an explanation of why their brother is so explosive. And it's not to do with them and to have some degree of compassion because they can be quite scared. That is a fear of our son for this. Yes, they fear that they could be hurt. Uh, I think it is a reassurance that mum or dad are in control. We will make sure you're safe. The best thing to do if he's really upset is go to another room, find something to do in your bedroom or uh, in the garden or somewhere like that, just to be away. So then you will be safe. Mum and dad know how to cope with it. We will deal with it. So those are my suggestions. Another meltdown question. Dear Dr. Tony, we have a 10-year-old son who is currently in a psychiatric hospital. In the School of Psychiatry, he is no longer bearable because he keeps freaking out when the teacher corrects things or when he loses at a game. He endangers the students and the teachers. He's actually a super nice boy when he's not stressed. Caregivers say the problem is he shows absolutely no understanding that his behavior is dangerous. He can't or doesn't reflect on his behavior. At home, he and his siblings are doing very well, except he doesn't like to play loser-winner games, and he runs away briefly when he makes a mistake. He has a normal IQ, and he speaks normally. How can we help him not to get stressed when he makes a mistake or loses? This is also an anxiety issue. This is a fear of making a mistake. A mistake is almost a phobia for making mistakes. And a mistake is, or not winning, is an emotional trigger for intense emotions that seem to be incredibly powerful and so powerful he finds very difficult to manage. Um, there's also issues of self-esteem, which is very fragile. He wants to show how capable he is, how smart he is, how good he is. And when this happens, it really does challenge his concept of self, that fragile self-esteem. Now, for this, I am indebted to Carol Gray, and I've got here um, Carol's, Carol Gray's social storybook. And what I'm going to do is go through how this is well recognized in autism is a fear of making a mistake. Carol Gray writes social stories to help children understand various aspects of the social world. And she has covered this in this new social storybook. Uh, published by Future Horizons in sure. the USA. And I'm going to take a section here, which is actually a whole section on mistakes. And it covers, um, for example, social stories on what is a mistake. As people grow, they learn from their mistakes. They may not make the same mistake again. However, People are always growing and having new experiences. For this reason, people are always making new mistakes. Most people try to answer questions correctly. They try to have good ideas. They try to do the right thing. As hard as people may try, though, they still make mistakes. Now, there's a, another story on Thomas Edison and mistakes, and that refers to... Um, uh, it is difficult to invent something. Thomas Edison made over 700 mistakes when he tried to make a practical light bulb. With each mistake, he learned what would not work. This brought him closer to knowing how to make a safe light bulb that would work well. Many students learn to stay calm when they make a mistake. This helps them think well and solve their problem efficiently and effectively. That way, they can learn from mistakes. In other words, when you get emotional, your intellect disintegrates. <laughs> so stay calm. When you're calm, you're smart. You are flexible in your thinking, and you will find the solution. Uh, there's also one about making a mistake survey, about finding people who could help you. And there's also uh, another section, actually, on games based on luck. And if a game is based on luck, it means that there's nothing a player can do to win or lose the game. 
players win because of luck. Many children learn to stay calm if they win or lose a game based on luck. That way, others may want to play the game with them again. So being calm also means you're not scary to other kids. They're more likely to want to play with you. Now, there's another one, how to lose a game and win friends, what to say and do. So I strongly recommend for this particular uh, author of that question, Carol Gray's Social Stories. You're not the only one who's had that. I strongly recommend Carol's approach. Now, with the difficulty in understanding the consequences on others, again, I would borrow from Carol Gray's comic strip conversations. That is, you draw in a particular event people as stick figures and speech and thought and emotion bubbles. And with those stick figures, you try and ask him, okay, when you get agitated, here's your mum, your sister, your brother, the teacher, your friend. Here's a thought bubble. What are they thinking or feeling when you get really upset? Often the child says, I don't know. Well, let's have a look. Are they going to be happy, sad, angry, scared, or don't know? So we give a series of options. And ha if you do identify, I think they're going to be scared. Okay, one to 10, how scared would they be? Uh, two, actually, there are nine. So it's going through that situation, going through why would you think they feel like that? What can you do to make them feel safe? So you draw. You draw the people concerned with speech, thought, and emotion bubbles to illustrate the reaction on us. In other words, when you understand, you say, ah, I see what you mean. So that's what I would suggest for that question. I know a number of neurotypicals that could use that book on how to be good losers or good winners. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget my origins are British, and we are very good losers because we lost everything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, diagnosis. So many questions are in this category. I've lumped a few together here. So again, we, we cover the basis for most people. This is about another evaluation. Hi there. My daughter was diagnosed high-functioning Asperger's at, at age four. She's now turning 16 and is doing brilliantly in school, has one best friend, and wants to study science at university. We ceased therapy at age 10 and traveled Australia for a year and then lived in Indonesia for a year. Most people would not believe she has autism. My question is, should she be reevaluated for autism? I'm just not sure if this is appropriate. I want her to have access to help in the future if she feels she needs it, but I have been told her diagnosis at four years of age should be followed up. Your thoughts would be helpful. Thank you. Mm. They're right. I think it should be followed up. However, I am concerned that the diagnosis was made at four and at 16, the signs aren't conspicuous. I wonder if she's actually camouflaging. So the autism is there, but she's learned how to camouflage. Now, there is a new uh, questionnaire, it's available on the internet, called the Self-Report Camouflaging of Autistic Traits Questionnaire, um, developed by Laura Hull and colleagues, including Simon Bauer and Cohen. Um, to identify in 25 questions aspects such as, quote, when I am interacting with someone, I deliberately copy their body language or facial expressions, a score of one to seven. I monitor my body language or facial expressions so that I appear relaxed. I have developed a script to follow in social situations. For example, a list of questions or topics of conversation. In social situations, I feel like I'm performing rather than being myself. In my own social interactions, I use behaviors that I have learned from watching other people interacting. So the autism may there, but she's camouflaging it. The issue is she's not being the authentic self and it can subsequently lead to exhaustion and depression. So that needs to be screened. Now, the next one, is to do with the diagnostic criteria for autism. And in DSM-5 TR, new one came out in April, text revised, there are a series of diagnostic criteria. The important one here is criteria D. This is the criteria. Symptoms cause clinically significant impairment 
in social, occupational or other important areas of functioning. And although the criteria are very precise in the social behavioral aspects, this is a subjective clinical decision of whether the severity or depth of autistic characteristics cause clinically significant impairment in social, occupational or other areas of functioning. So the person may have the characteristics, but not the impairment. Now, the thing is, uh, you then are, as we have autism levels one, two and three, I saw somebody uh, last week and I said, actually, you have autism 0.5. So there's a little bit there, but not enough to confirm the diagnosis, but could become more conspicuous when stressed or circumstances change, like support uh, a family or employment or things like that. When stress occurs, those features may become more conspicuous. So it is possible that the person over time can crack the code of socializing, mm -hmm. can develop abilities of making friendships and so on that are genuine. So is it camouflaging? Is it genuine? Mm -hmm. If it's genuine, then there is the possibility of being subclinical and potentially stating that autism was a description of her early childhood, mm -hmm. but not of her later adolescence. Mm -hmm. Very good. Next question. Could you please tell me if Dr. Atwood has ever done a talk on the misdiagnosis of ASD or how one can get this diagnosis withdrawn? A few years ago, my son, then nine, was diagnosed with ASD, but now that he's a teen, he displays behaviors that are more closely aligned with ADHD. The ASD diagnosis has been of no help, as my son has not required any NDIS therapy or supports, nor does he want them. Going into high school, he finds the label more of a hindrance than a help, and he himself sees more ADHD characteristics in himself and says, I don't have autism. Can we have our son reassessed to get a more accurate diagnosis and remove the ASD diagnosis? Again, the first point is it's okay to have a review because first of all, the clinical picture may have changed. It may be clearer than when he was younger. Now, um, the second point is uh, that he may be well be right that the ADHD has more of an effect in his daily life. And he is identifying that uh, impulsivity, that distractibility and all those sorts of things. But there's another dimension that he may fear the peer's perception of autism. And he may have seen other kids uh, being cruel to autistic kids and thinking, I don't want that. No, no. And, and so may be scared, not necessarily of the diagnosis itself, but how his peer group is going to react to that diagnosis. Now, as a teen, he is very um, sensitive to how he's going to be perceived by his peer group, and he doesn't want uh, labels. So I think at this stage, we would accept his perception that I don't have autism. But what we may do with him is use personality. I'm the sort of person who likes to talk about T-34 tanks, but I'm not very good at reading signs of boredom. If I'm boring you, please tell me. So it's going through to describe his characteristics of I'm the sort of person who. So it describes his personality and that's what needs to be explored is who are you without using the A word because the moment you use the A word, he's gonna reject it on principle. Mm -hmm. So you need to go uh, with it. Mm -hmm. We get asked a lot about online diagnostic tests. And here's another question. We're often told not to trust diagnostics from online resources. So what is the value of taking an ASD online test, such as Aspie quiz, AQ, RADS, etc.? And how reliable are they in identifying possibly autistic individuals? Well, this is important for me because I'm one of the authors of a range of screening questionnaires. And that's what they are. They're screening. They're to validate a referral for a diagnostic assessment. They're not to replace a diagnostic assessment. They're there to say, this is warranted. It's not predicting accurately the outcome of that diagnostic assessment, but it means that this is a genuine referral that in the diagnostic assessment, 
those characteristics will be validated. Um, so they are reasonably reliable, but not infallible. But they're useful information for the clinician because when the person makes a comment that could be autistic, then you can go further, deeper, explain it. Because you can't ask questions of a questionnaire, but you can in a diagnostic assessment. Mm -hmm. Was the question fully understood? Can we give some illustrations of this, etc.? So in a diagnostic assessment, there's more detail that's explored to the answers and statements in a questionnaire. So they're useful. Mm -hmm. uh, they're useful for parents or the individual to say, hmm, I think I may have autism. Ah, my score is within the potential range. I feel more confident in seeking a diagnostic assessment. Mm -hmm. They are also useful because when I do a diagnostic assessment, I send the individual a whole series of questionnaires. And that's fascinating because I get a lot of information which provides a structure now for the diagnostic assessment. Mm -hmm. Next is sex, dating, intimacy, and marriage. I have difficulties even imagining a real, healthy relationship and sex. I've managed to find my way in friendships, and now I have a small but close circle of friends that are very supportive and understanding. But any sexual or romantic relationship, I just can't seem to find a way in. For instance, I do not understand if and or how I am attractive. Also, I'm not sure how to handle feeling attracted to someone. I assume that's what I'm feeling. I tend to freeze if I notice sexual desire towards me. Someone could be chasing me with a loved themed lorry and I still wouldn't notice them flirting. My question is, <laughs> my question is, how can I at least get enough confidence to actually see someone and not walk right into them? I can be intense in my thoroughness, especially since this problem cuts rather deep. Mm. We use a dimension uh, of zero to 10. Zero to five is like, six to 10 is love. So what this person has done is learn like. They've learned friendship. So it's part way through the thermometer. Um, and you need to start with friendship skills to make relationship skills. Because when you have friendships, you're learning about the amount of disclosure about the inner self and trust is going to be very important. In autism, trust is crucial. Uh, you can share interest. You can learn the art of compromise, of sharing, of both emotional and practical support for each other as friends. So it becomes the basis of a long-term relationship. So you're practicing it. So you're great. You're on the right track. Mm -hmm. But um, it's a bit premature, perhaps, to be confident in a, a, a closer relationship. Now, the, the issue in romantic is that you are reading and expressing the subtle art of flirting. And if you have difficulty reading body language, the most uh, subtle and yet most profound in its implications is flirting. And the signals are so fleeting and others seem to just know intuitively what's happening with body language. Now, there are a number of books on body language. Um, there are some that have become uh, conventional ones. Uh, there's a book by Alan Pease, Body Language. This is an older version. There are new versions around. Um, there are also some that you can get, like this book, Body Language Phrase Book, 500 Ways to Read the Signs. But also, interestingly, a lot of apps now, and I have quite a few on my uh, phone that I will use with a client who's exploring this area, that goes through how to read body language with actors, which is perhaps a little bit better. So look on your uh, iPhone uh, for the possibility of apps for reading body language, but will include uh, flirting as a possibility. Now, the next thing is, you need a friend or mentor to check your perception of the situation. Am I reading them right? But also your own intensity, because you don't know, okay, text messages, how many, how, how many should I give? Should I give one a day, 10 a day, uh, one a week? Uh, how many? How do I know if I am being too strong? How do I know when I'm not being strong enough? It is very subtle. You need a mentor. 
So it's someone who is a good friend or maybe a relative to go through that. But also you have uh, in love very powerful emotions and it's feelings that you may not have had before. There may have been love for people within the family, but this is somewhat outside the family. And it's it, you're dealing with feelings that are powerful, but in autism there can be a difficulty perceiving and expressing feelings. Mm -hmm. Love is one of them. Now, there are a series of books that for typical individuals. The Secret Business of Relationships, Love and Sex, which is really for typical individuals to understand that. And in autism, we're often talking about this with teenagers. And Jeannie Uhlenkamp, who's absolutely delightful, she's based in the United States, and she wrote The Guide to Dating for Teenagers with Asperger's Syndrome. Now, although it's teenagers and high school, uh, a lot of the information would also be appropriate for adults too mm -hmm. in how to read that. So you're on the way. You are learning about relationships from friendship. So keep going. One day, somebody may come into your life that you go beyond friendship. I just thought that note was so encouraging too. Here's a question about special interests. Hi, Dr. Tony. You've helped me so much with these videos and understanding who I am and coming to terms with my autism. I have a question about special interests and cycling through them. I'm not sure if it's because I have ADHD and ASD. For example, one moment I'll be really into a certain band for maybe a year or so, and then I find another band and I just drop the band that I used to be obsessed with. Or one moment I'll really love dolls, and then next I'm deeply interested in making candles, and I forget about my interest in dolls. Sometimes I'll come back to an interest that I once discarded and I'll become interested all over again, as if I'd never dropped it. What could be causing this? Well, my clinical experience is that every interest has a use-by date. Now, the use-by date may be hours, it may be decades, but there will be closure. Now, what you can get is several interests at the same time, each with its own duration. Now, the thing about your interests is they create excitement. They are one of the greatest pleasures in your life. You have a thrill of finding out and discovering knowledge and so on. Um, the thing is, though, when you know roughly all there is to know about the topic, a particular group and so on, you listen to all their music, you know that they're um, very talented and there is a, an enjoyment to it, but it has its ending that's occurring, you need something new to experience the pleasure again. And it needs to be, right, that was so exciting, but it's not so exciting anymore because I know all about it. Right, I want excitement, I need a new interest. And although we use the term interest, it comes from original diagnostic criteria. Sometimes autistic individuals will say, these are my passions. And I think passion is a very good description. So it's exciting. When you've learned it all, I want that excitement again. I want something new. And you may go back to some of the ones you uh, enjoyed before as a sense of nostalgia. Quite a few autistic individuals will keep the interest memorabilia or whatever it may be. And it is associated with happy memories. It's like neurotypicals will look at photo albums of family gatherings with a sense of nostalgia or enjoyment. An autistic individual may do the same for the special interest. So you may go back uh, and you may well keep interests uh, for longer than others. Mm -hmm. So um, it's your pleasures. This is about getting and keeping a job. Hi, Dr. Tony. My name is Wendy and I'm about to turn 30 years old and only just discovered nine months ago that I'm 100% an Aspie and I'm sure my mom is too. I felt absolutely stuck in my grocery store job for over 10 years. I don't want to be there my whole life, especially because I know they would never recognize me for promotion because of my Aspie traits. Plus, it drains me to work on in that environment. It creates stress, anxiety, and even burnout at times. But I'm so paralyzed to make such a big life change as trying to find a new job. The idea of donning a new schedule, routine, work tasks is utterly overwhelming. Though I have many strong passions, I suspect comorbid ADHD is why I've never been able to fully nurture one interest in order to make a career choice. 
Do you have any advice for me? I fear that I will be a grocery store worker for my entire life. Mm. Okay, first of all, commendations for coping for 10 years. That really shows um, determination, uh, loyalty, and a whole range of things. So in your job resume, to be there for 10 years is actually a good thing. But it, it may have reached its use by date. It may also be burning you out, and that burning out is often due to a number of social sensory factors, but also a feeling that you're not actually understood, and that can be really quite debilitating. So it may well be time to move on, but it's fear of change. How well will I cope? There's that degree of uncertainty. Now, I'm not sure where this person lives, but in some countries there are employment agencies often set up by governments. Uh, they may employ or pay for an agency to do that or they may do it themselves where they assess abilities, interests and so on to find a particular career. So if there is an employment agency in your country, please contact that agency. Say, I have autism about to be confirmed or say I have autistic characteristics. I need guidance, but also encouragement in changing job. And it's important, if you can, to have a job you move into rather than just leave. Mm -hmm. And then I don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. So there are a number of resources. And I'm going to go and get some more resources. And first of all, it's Autism Working, a seven-stage plan for thriving at work by Michelle Garnett and myself, published by Jessica Kingsley, publishers last year. And it goes through strengths, weaknesses, what you can do. It's a self-help manual. Maybe you can go through it with someone you know well. But that will help you determine what are your autistic strengths? What support do you need because of those autistic characteristics? How can those characteristics be good in particular jobs? Now, Michelle and I have what's called Atwood and Garnet events. We run webinars and we recently did one on autism working, on how to use the manual, but we were um, joined by Barb Cook, has autism herself. She very much supports autistic individuals in a work environment, but knows many of the issues from personal experience. And you can download that. So if you go to www.atwoodandgarnetevents.com, you can download autism working. Now, Jessica Kingsley publishers have a variety of books that will help. This is a good one. Um, Barbara Bissonnette has written quite a few. This is a, the complete guide to getting a job for people with Asperger's. Another one is helping adults with Asperger's syndrome to get and stay hired. Uh, another one, how to find work that works uh, for people with Asperger's. So now that you know you have Asperger's, great, oh, because it's an opportunity to access all the information, turning skills and strengths into careers for young adults with autism spectrum disorders. So there's a lot that you can access and potentially government agencies. But what you need to do is also, and this is something we go through in our own book, Autism Working, is check that it is an autism friendly workplace. You need to just check on a sensory level, a social level, a level of understanding, the possibility of unexpected changes, etc. So this can be something you may need someone who can help you determine is this an autism friendly workplace. So good luck. Good luck indeed. This question is about masking. Dr. Tony, I was arrested a year ago, and I go to trial soon. I'm afraid that my autism traits, such as stims and tonal effect, will make the jurors think badly of me. I'm worried about the stress of the trial and my ability to mask effectively. Should I be focusing on masking or appearing normal? Mm. First of all, I do think you need to check um, with your legal representative is autism relevant in relation to the alleged offences? They may be able to give you advice on the advantages and disadvantages of disclosure. Now, knowing that somebody before a court has autism 
is very important for the court in terms of mitigating circumstances due to the autism, but also in terms of sentencing. So generally, my clinical experience has been disclosure of the diagnosis has been to the advantage, not only of the person, but also of the court would be very important. Now, there are several books um, on this topic. And it's uh, something that I've been involved with as an expert witness. So one of the recent ones is uh, working with autistic people in the criminal justice and forensic mental health service, a handbook for practitioners. So that will go through some of the issues, but also this one, representing people with autism spectrum disorder, a practical guide for criminal defense lawyers. So your lawyer needs to access that to work out is autism an advantage or disadvantage in being disclosed to the court. For those who want to go uh, further, there's this very big textbook uh, called Handbook of Autism Spectrum Disorder and the Law. Fred Volkmar and colleagues were the editors of that book. So that gives a lot more information. Now, the person concerned uh, hasn't said what the offences are. One of the offences that can occur is accessing uh, pornography on the internet and being charged with accessing child pornography. And this is a book specifically on that, The Autism Spectrum, Sexuality and the Law, edited or written by myself, Isabel Henno, and in particular, Nick Dubin. So that's very important for the individual. So um, my, my advice is basically talk to your legal representative who needs to explore, a, is autism a mitigating factor or a factor in relation to sentencing? In other words, to prevent a custodial sentence. The next category is living with autism. We have three questions in this category. First is about autism and ADHD. Hi, I'm a 29 year old female and have recently been diagnosed with ADHD and ASD. I'm trying to see the positive sides of my condition, but I feel like my ADHD is impairing my ASD strengths and vice versa. So that I'm basically only left with the negative sides of each. For example, I have huge motivation for my special interests, but I can't commit to them due to my ADHD. I feel really lost. What can I do? Yeah, my concern is that last sentence. I feel really lost. What can I do? Okay, uh, what you're trying to do is um, enjoy and take advantage of the benefits of, of both uh, autism and ADHD. Um, the thing is, though, with ADHD, you can use medication. There are a range of medications to reduce the effects of attention deficit disorder and psychological strategies for what we call executive functioning, because there are a lot of people with ADHD, not necessarily autistic. And so there is medication and psychological programs for ADHD. Now, there's no medication for autism. Um, but what you might consider is professional and autistic peers who could help you in this situation. There may be autism specialists who can guide you in terms of how you can switch on or off the autism or ADHD in various situations, um, but also may be able to give you their personal experience because often the greatest knowledge on autism is within those who have experienced it. So if you join internet support groups, you can post your concerns. Now the chances are somebody else is that, yeah, I was in the same situation. This didn't work, although I was tempted, but this really did work. So you have a degree of confidence that this is advice from someone who's been in the same situation. The association between autism and ADHD is around 75% of autistic individuals also have signs of ADHD. So it's very common. Mm -hmm. And in your description of being lost, you are seeking advice and direction. And I think it needs to be from professionals and peers. The next question is about research on autism. Dr. Tony, is there a way to participate in ASD research? As an adult daughter, with a suspected parent on the autism spectrum, 
Would you know of any researchers or journals seeking to interview or speak with such adults on their experiences? Experiences of being raised by and dealing with such a parent. There's not much as of yet to be found on this topic, but it must start somewhere, and there's no better place than the voices of those who live the experience. Please help give us a voice. Oh, I, I must, uh, I, well, I, I don't must, I want to, to share my personal interest in that topic, because I was a child with an autistic parent, and it does affect your sense of self, your life in many ways. So I strongly endorse the need for research in this area. Now, sometimes when people are conducting research, they will go on the internet and post almost like an advert for people to contribute for their research. So you'll have a question, we're interested in interviewing those who had an autistic mother or father or both uh, parents autistic and to do a survey of what it was like, developing a questionnaire, comments, and so on. And you can often get several hundred people who contribute to that. So there can be an advert for the research. The second thing is, uh, on my webpage, tonyatwood.com.au, actually I have a page, a section on participation in research. If you go on my webpage to resources and research, you can find out what who is seeking research, but I checked <laughs> yesterday and there's there's nobody posted that on my web page. There's a lot of other research you can contribute to. Mm -hmm. The other option you can do is find who has published on this topic uh, by Google Scholar and you type in autism parent and so on. And so I, yesterday I, I checked that out. Have there been any publications on what's it like to have an autistic parent? And I couldn't find any. Uh, but if there was, you could then contact the lead author on Google Scholar. It will give you the uh, original article, their email address or whatever university they are. And you can contact them and say, are you continuing this research and so on. Um, and in my clinical work, I run workshops for the children of autistic parents. Um, and there is a new book on being an autistic mum, but it's from a mum's perspective, not the child's perspective. Mm -hmm. And we need research. So can I <clears throat> encourage you to search that further? And if you do find somebody who's conducting research on this, please let me know, because I would like to know about it and uh, contribute to it. So those are the suggestions. Good. Next is about DBT and autism. Dr. Tony, do you have any experiences with applying dialectic behavior therapy to autistic people? I'm a psychiatrist diagnosed with Asperger's and working with DBT in a correctional setting. Learning about DBT and practicing it has helped me personally a lot in understanding and managing my own emotions. DBT, dialectical behavior therapy, um, has been applied to autistic individuals. I'm not trained in DBT myself, but I have met clients who have experienced DBT and I have colleagues who conduct DBT. The results have been positive. When you look at the research, there's actually remarkably little. There's a, a couple of research studies that I found. Uh, one, that's the person who asked this question, is a psychiatrist was in the uh, BMC Psychiatry in 2020, the effect of DBT in autism spectrum patients with suicidality or self-destructive behavior. So that was a study that looked at that. And another one uh, that was by H-U-N-T-J-E-N-S, Hunchens. Now another one by Cornwall, I can say that fairly easily, <laughs> in um, Psycholo uh, British Journal of Psychology Bulletin 2021 last year was the evaluation of a radically open DBT therapy in an adult community mental health team effectiveness in people with autism spectrum disorders. So people are starting to actually conduct research on this area. So all I can say is the great advantage of it is that it takes a lot more time to help the person perceive and regulate their emotions, much more than cognitive behavior therapy will do. CBT 
uh, assumes that person can perceive and regulate their emotions fairly well. DBT means, no, you've got a problem with this. We're going to focus on it. So mm -hmm. I do encourage people to look positively at DBT. So for yourself as a psychiatrist, definitely, please do. Wonderful. Last question about gender dysphoria. Hello, Tony. My daughter has declared herself transgender. She has many symptoms of autism and Asperger's. Her psychologist already suggested it and in a month will be having her tested. I suspect I am also on the spectrum. I have a good relationship with my daughter. She's got a great mind, but she has become wrapped up in the transgender ideology, postmodern ideas and all. Any suggestions how I can deal with it? Mm. What I like is that you have a good rapport with her. She trusts you. You know her well. So please explore the transgender world together. She will need someone who knows her to discuss the new information, the new options and potential outcomes. So it's being non-judgmental. It's OK, you're interested in this. Let's explore it together. Let's have a look at what may be relevant to you, what may not be what your thoughts are, what are the positives, what are the negatives, and let's explore it in a way um, for the two of you is going to be far more effective and for her far more confident in terms of any decisions she's going to make, knowing that you'll be there to support it. So please consolidate that rapport you've got. Now, Jessica Kingsley Publishers, once again, have lots of books in it. I keep mm -hmm. promoting jkp.com. <laughs> this is a new one that's come out. It's called Working with Autistic, Transgender and Non-Binary People, uh, edited by Marianthi Corti, K-O-U-R-T-I. Actually, a very good book, a very, an excellent paper by my friend and colleague Isabel Heno is in that book. There's another book from JKP, Supporting Transgender Autistic Youth and Adults, a guide for professionals and families. That's going to be important by Finn Grattan. And that will go through a lot of useful information. Um, there's also a Yen Perkis and Wen Lawson, The Autistic Trans Guide to Life, another useful book, but another one that may be considered uh, Gender Identity, Sexuality and Autism, voices from across the spectrum. So it's really exploring information, not only from the professionals, but also autistic individuals mm -hmm. who have transitioned what their thoughts and feelings are. So she needs people who have gone down the same journey, the same mm -hmm. path. What advice can they give? And But also, as her mum, I do think it is very important that you really work on this together. Yeah. Dr. Tony, that's all the questions we have for this session. Thank you for some great questions. Mm -hmm. They're very thoughtful. I thought, oh, that's a good question. I, I'm going to explore a little bit more on that. Yeah. So I like the questions. They really um, encourage me to, to explore things in more detail. Well, I wish we could answer every question, but there's just not enough time to go through all of them. So until next time, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.